Yeah, basically, I just uh, play around with tidy models and try to explore and then try to do my own stuff and, <laughs> and see how it goes. Uh, so the, the book goes, when they said that they want to use this car seat data set, and they, they had this sales that is actually a continuous variable, but to make it to a classification problem, they change the values of sales such that if it's like greater than eight, it's high, and if it's lower than or equals to eight, it's low. So the ver so this was the sales, and we change it to a high and just a yes or no. And this and the other factors, uh, I think I, I add a link to the website the documentation so these are the what the other column means so i what i did was that i do a split with the training and test and then i use a cross flow validation a tenfold validation for the validation part because you're gonna use it to tune the cost complexity uh parameters so for the recipes uh, they put the high as the one that we're going to predict as whether it's a yes or no with all the predictors uh, in this case there was no other pre-processing step unlike the previous few tutorials like the last like the last so where you have to like normalize your data and something like that but in this case for the trees uh, there is no like pre-processing step. So later what was done is that they decide to put the, to choose the model and they have this parsnip decision tree where there's some compulsory parameters. But for simplicity, we just only want to tune the cost complexity. And for the tree that lies in the number of how deep the tree goes, they, they just stick it to four. So that the tree will look so complicated. The, the, the rest is to make it a classification problem and to choose which uh, function to use, which or basically which package to use to make the tree, the classification tree. And I, I set an engine parameter, this model equals the tree because it gives me this warning message when I start to plot it later and somehow putting this model equals to true will remove this warning. <laughs> so we can see after you have declared the, the model, we can use a translate to give to give a summary of what we have put in. And if it, in terms of the R part function, what we're actually putting in as well. So after this for tidy models, we have to make a workflow with our recipe and the models. Our recipe was declared earlier on, like who was the predictor, who was the one supposed to predict. And there's no pre-processing step in this case. And this is our specification, our model. So we have created our workflow. So now that we have our workflow and we need to give certain values for the cost complexity. So I decide to use the, the DAOs package to give different values for the cost complexity from, uh, in this case, it's from 0 0.001 to 10. It's something that they use and we split them into 10 parts. So there are 10 values split equally. The 10 of them from 0 0.001 to 10. And then we use these different values of the cost complexity to and apply it to our cost validated data, which is our full, our 10 full cost validated data, to see which value of this is the, uh, the best one, the one that gives you the the, the highest accuracy and so on and so forth. 
So this one is just to make my computer use more cores. Otherwise, the process will be quite slow. Even though in the later steps, the process starts to get a bit slow because the, the models get more complicated. So in this part, they do the tuning and the gift for the for each of the different values they apply on the cross-validated data set and they have these results but because it's in a table and all these are all data sets we can't see them so what we can do is to unnest them and to plot them in like graphs like this so uh, tune as an auto plot to see how the different metrics uh, behave for different cost complexity parameters from 0 0.001 to 10 and we can see that uh, we somehow have an optimized value around this part uh, more like you see they kind of give a different <laughs> like this one says it's here this one says it's here this one says it's here so not all the metrics give you the same optimized value and we just have to choose one of them later. <laughs> so we can also collect the metrics for each cost complexity, like in this case here. And then I, I just found a way to plot this using ggplot to if, if you want to make it look in the way that you like. <laughs> But we can choose the tune show best to give the top few values of a given metric. So this is just one example that I use. It's we use the I just use the accuracy, which is this one here. And they pick the top five. So it's the top five. And the one that gives the highest accuracy, we just take the select best to pick this value as the optimized uh, cost complexity. And once we have the optimized complex cost complexity, we put it back to the workflow. We use the finalized workflow with the optimized parameters to so now we have the optimized parameters in our model and then we apply this model to the back to the training set to train the the model itself after we have uh, created the model we can then uh Take a look at what the model really does. So because this is a still a parsnip object, it's still of an R parts object, we, we need we can't plot any visualizations out of it. So what we need to do is to use this function called extract fit engine. And once you do this, right, you get back your R parts object. So this is the same output as you put for R parts. And from there you can start plotting your plots as though it was an R parts uh, output. So like for this case, uh, this is the results that I have for our parts. And we can see like for things with higher sale, like if the for the car seats, like if the if it's in good quality, then the sales will be high. And if it's a not so good quality, like bad or medium, then maybe the sales will not be so good. And of course, uh, there are also other factors that's involved, like whether if the price is high, maybe price high means better quality and can have better sales. Otherwise, it's just how much is advertising and this kind of stuff. Uh, I think for more information of these values, I think they have this documentation that uh, you can scroll up to see what these three values means for classification and then go back to here then we can also have the, to see the variable importance so to do that uh, I use this uh, VIP package but 
this time the function to use the VIP package is not extract feed engine, it's extract feed pass name instead, which so I use this function and then I apply the VIP, the VI, and to get the variable importance. And it seems to be similar to the tree itself, showing that the shelf lock is very important and helps to best separate the prices uh, and the sales. It helps best separate the, the high sales, followed by the price, which is like the level of the second part here. And there's another package that I found out when I was reading some blogs from Julia Silky. It's the part trees package. So what it does is that it can take two continuous variables and it can plot like trees to see better, like the interpretation to see why it works. So I decided to try that on this data set as well. Uh, however, uh, the problem is that our shelf log is actually uh, in discrete form. It's not continuous. So I, I just like to cheat the system a bit and put minus one as bad, zero as good, and one as uh, zero as mean and one as good. So I change a bit. And then I do the part three plot to make it continuous. And when I do the plot, we can see like, the price, which is like our second best uh, parameter, and the, this is the sales, whether it's high or low, we can like easily separate them to give better interpretation of why these two variables work so well. And we can see like those with higher qualities, they are usually quite high in sales, like even though there will be some message missing here. But I think when it comes to medium, things get a bit hard to differentiate there, and that's where we need perhaps the other predictors help to best separate this part of the data set. So now that we see how our model is doing, we apply on a test data set that we created earlier on, which is our class seed test. So I use the uh, opman function to give new predictions for the class seed test. And what it does is that it creates a new column. Unlike the regression ones, which just have one co new column created, there was for classification, there was three columns that was created. One was the predicted class that just says yes or no. And they also give two additional columns. Like I think they were like probability values to see like why, how much helps the probability that it says no and yes based on the test data set. And I think it just takes the higher of the two and just put it as no or yes. Uh, we can also uh, check the results, how true it is, because like you can see like this part, it, it guessed wrongly. <laughs> it's supposed to be high, but it predicted it as no and it, it made a wrong guess. So we use a confusion matrix. So I, I use one method is to use the yardstick confidence matrix function. And you can see that it's not too bad. There was, there was some, mis, uh, some misclassification, but I think the, 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 is the, the tree is able to differentiate like yes and no is quite well for majority of the data set, maybe because of the strong predictors the two strong predictors that we found earlier. Um, this is the part where we uh, can get the metrics out of it, like the test data, the match, the accuracy from the, and in terms of the, I would say this is like the, com the Confucius matrix statistics that but usually uh, what I also have another function that helps to do this in a better way, which is from this package here, which is this one. So I duplicate this. So this, this, so this is the same plot uh, as the previous one. It's just that it, it displays the matrix in a more easier to see way. 
we can also uh, plot the ROC curve using the yardstick package. And from our test result, which was uh, this one here, we can create an ROC plot is using the yardstick function, uh, the ROC curve function to get the, the data. And from the data, we can use an auto plot to plot the ROC curve. Alternatively, we can also use GG plot from as well to plot the same thing. This is just me trying different ways to do the same thing. We can also view the um, overall name. Yes. Can I ask a question? Sorry. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Can you uh, again explain the yardstick function that you had up there? I didn't get it. And this one. Yeah, the yardstick, the semicolon, semicolon, semicolon. What, what does the yardstick portion do? Uh, the yes, this yeah, this ROC curve function gives you this data set, so that you can plot these curves. Oh, I see. Otherwise, you can't plot this curve without with just the. I'm oh, sorry, we've just these three values. You need to have like the sensitivity and the specificity from a confusion matrix. Of course, you can use the confusion matrix to calculate all these values, but I think Yastic has, has an easier way to do this, it has a function that makes it easier to keep plot this, to give this plot as well. And then we. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we, we can also uh, have the predict the overall accuracy. Uh, this is just a different way using uh, this last feed, but I rarely use them for the classification because I usually, it is the last feed is just to take the final feed from the workflow and Put it, instead of putting your test data set and using the part snip augment function, uh, you can just also use the split that we had earlier on from the R samples package. So I go back to the top. So instead of using the test, we can just use the whole split itself. And then we can apply it for this function. It's, it's just a different function, but it does the same thing as well. So we can also collect the accuracy and ROC curve, but they only give you the summarized data. They don't give you as much detail unlike the part snip augment function that, like this one here. So this next part they do is the regression tree. So instead of classification, they do regression and they use a different data set. They use this Boston data set, which has these columns and they want to predict this median value of the homes based on the other predictors. So uh, it's, it's kind of like a similar thing whereby uh, because we are tuning the same thing. So this is just a different data set. So, every, so from here on, this one is a bit repetitive. So again, like we first split them, we create a recipe, and this is our variable that we want to predict. And this is all its predictors, and we use the training data set. We first create the recipe, and then next we create the model. So the model, uh, we do the same thing because I use the same function and the same tuning parameter, the same place to tune. Uh, and this time I, I decide not to keep the tree depth as four and just use this use its default value, and then I create. Once I create the specification and specify the model, I put them into the workflow. And once I put in the workflow, I can start tuning the beta for different cost complexity parameters. 
So similar to the previous method, I create a grid to give different values of the cost complexity. Uh, the range is different this time. And this time has a smaller, a larger range. And I decided to test it. And then I decided to create 10 values of this. So there are 10 from 10 values from 0 0.001 to uh, 10 values from 0 0.001 all the way to 10. And then for different cost complexity values, I apply it to the cost validation data, which is the full, this method as Boston flow. And then I have my different metrics for my different cost validated data sets, which because there were 10 of them. Uh, however, they, they came there were some issues. So because some of them like the R square couldn't be calculated. So that's why there were some notes written there. So as long as you have notes written, that means there is some issues actually compared to the previous one where the notes was actually an empty table. But, but I still continue the process anyway, and and we can see that I think for this case, I think the I think the smallest one should be the best value. So I just collect all the metrics together, and this is just plotting the same thing in ggplot too. So I just don't do too much on this. So we just Take a parameter like this one and we take the, the best value. So in this, so I just show the top five and then I pick the best one. And once I pick the best one, I put it back into the workflow to finalize it. And with the finalized workflow, I, I use it to train the data. And after I train the data, I can like I will have my model and then I can plot my model and to see how the tree works. In this case, uh, it seems that R and this variable- Let me zoom in on the figure a bit. It's a bit hard to see the figure. Yeah. Hard, yeah. 300%. Mm. Oh, I think I got too big. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, <oops. laughs> now I can't see it. Okay. okay, okay. Let's make it smaller. Let's go back to putting regression tree and then. Okay, let's see. If we can zoom one more time. Okay, I think that should look yeah. better. Yeah, now it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, now uh, we can see that usually the top ones, like where the parameters come, usually it's like, usually it's the most important one. Like, but <laughs> so like they think that RM and this else that seems to be the one making the two predictions, like they're kind of like running the show. And just to say like what these numbers mean, I, I think like for this case, like, the top number is the predicted value and the bottom is just the percentage. So this is all the predicted values, but usually when we focus more on the terminal nodes. Yeah, we can see that R and L stats. I think RM and L stats seems to be the one that's contributing the most to the medium value. It seems that uh, I think when you have a where your house has more rooms, I think it will mostly be more expensive. <laughs> so I can, yeah, I think you have more rooms and you will be more expensive. <laughs> so it kind of makes sense in this case. It seems the percentage at the bottom is wrong up, right? Because like if you look at the second level, the 16, percent like nine plus six that was only like 15 so this is round yeah, off is it yeah. to get 16 percent so all the values percentage uh, the nine plus six is actually it should be uh, add up to 16. the top part 
So yeah. no, 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 the top part, the row. So 100% for this row. This row is 84 plus 16, give you 100%. Uh -huh. Third row is 34 plus 50 plus 9 plus 6 give you 100%. So it oh. tells you uh, for each of your data set, 34% goes to here, 50% goes to here, 9% goes to here, 6% goes to here. So they don't sum up actually. Uh, okay. Yeah, we remember that when you reach the terminal mode, you see to only 2% of your data goes to here, and probably these 2% of the data will contribute to the mean. Its mean will be 7.2. Mm -hmm. So if we sum all these values up, they should be quite close to 100%. Yeah, I'll just assume they a bit like they do round off itself by like, to like one decimal, two decimals, but they should add up to 100%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that yeah. So we go to variable input. And so I did the same thing again and and again like based on the plots here, it, it, it kind of shows and says the same thing that these two variables are contributing a lot to the prediction. I tried using part trees as well, but I don't really know how to make it look nice. <laughs> So we can see like, like the most expensive prices here, sort of fall in like the higher values of RM and the lower values of L stats. And then the, as it gets more and more cheaper, like the RM starts to get lower and the L stats just gets higher. So there seems to be some good splitting around here. But I guess why there were so many splits in here was because I make the tree a bit deep, so that's why there was many uh cuts here. But I think if we make if we limit the number of trees uh to a smaller value, because I I, I did not limit it like the classification problem, but I only have four levels. So I let the machine choose the limits that they want. But I think if you make it a, to a smaller number, uh and then you do we uh, reuse its data? The cuts will be smaller and will look less complicated. And then I try to put it on the test data set using the Altman function from Parsnip, and it creates a new column to predict this one. So you can see, like for some of them, like the prediction is quite close for some, and some of them was a bit off unfortunately, but I think both of them kind of fit quite well and quite close to the actual values. So we use yardstick to get some parameter, some error parameters, and then uh, we can also uh, use uh, two last fit as well to display all of them at the same time. Uh, I should also try to use collect prediction to, 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 it's just a different way of doing it because the, this, if you pass snip argument to collect your predict, the prediction is already here, but if you use the last fit function, you need to call another function to collect prediction to get the same values. So it's just two different ways to get the same thing. So this is method one using Altman, the prediction value is here. And if you use the last fit uh, function method, you need to call this additional function to get the prediction. But nevertheless, I tr try to plot the predictions over the actual values. And it seems that most of them are quite close to the vertical line here. So I think the, it's this model is not, not, not too bad. So they decide to improve the model further by using the bagging for one part of bagging. So uh, they say that the this R package, the random forest also has also able to use bagging, but you need to set some constant parameters. Um, 
I'm so sorry, I forgot to add the cost validated data, but uh, it's actually the same value from the previous one. So because I used the same seed. But I learned that most of them are the same. The only difference is that is the function is different. It's not decision trees anymore. It's actually uh ran, the rainforest. And they use this one is to tell me to use all of the predictors. And then, uh, because the, the, yeah, it's using all the predictors to create your new trees from the bootstrap data set. And then, uh, for this case, I use the engine random forest, and I set this import is equal to true because I want to plot the the important plots later, the variable important plots later. So I set this to true, and I set it to regression. So it's the same. So this is like the functions and this is what it has. And then I create the recipe. I have the model. I make a workflow. And then I try to uh, find, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I think I didn't tune anything on this yeah i forgot i think there's no tuning in this one so oh yeah so maybe there's no tuning in this one it's uh, i i kind of confused between the boosting and the bagging because the boosting has a lot of tuning and this has no tuning uh, sorry sorry about that so this actually has no tuning right because it used the, the whole column so uh we just apply on the training data and then I can extract the the verb the importance value using uh, extract fit pass new and plot them. And then I just work it on the test data. And so everything was kind of the same. And this time the accuration for this part seems to be slightly better than regression trees and check the error rates uh, for regression tree it's around 4.64 whereas the the bagging the bagging bagging is around 3.9 so i think the bagging does work better than the decision trees and maybe because of this part here where like the prediction starts to improve so this part is they use the random forest this time the random forest difference from bagging is that instead of using all the columns to create trees for each bootstrap data they randomly choose the predictors instead so that all the trees will, will be will look as different as much uh, i've seen it, they look more different than the, each other like they, they want they don't want to make the trees to be the same so uh in this case they is it they didn't set any parameters there because they just use the default values for this mtr y function which is the number of predictors so they said that the documentation like the random forest if it's a regression tree they'll just use this amount of variables randomly and if it's classification just choose the root p variables and then the same thing as the bagging is that i set importance to true so that i can plot my importance plot and everything else is the same because we have no tuning so we just create our workflow we fit the training model and then we extract the importance variable uh, and yeah, the, it still gets the same variables as the being important and this time like compared to the previous few ones right because you can see like because we pick the predictors in a random way, some, some variables have seems to be have some increase in importance. Uh, this part is me trying to show like there's other ways to, to view this 
variable importance as well because actually the random forest package has a function to show its importance but to display it you need to use the extract fit engine so that you get back the random forest object instead of the past knit object so this part is to extract the random forest object and once you have the object itself you can start treating it as a random forest object and start plotting its importance and this is the values that it has come out. So the difference between these two is that this one just measures the importance by permuting this predictor and then they reclassify the tree and we recreate the model and they see how much the model performs compared to the one without the permutation. So if the variable is important, if you permute that, variables, the new tree with the new permitted variable will be likely to perform worse. So that's why it has a higher mean square error because it's an important variable and if you permute them and mix them all around, the new tree with the permuted variable will might need to perform worse than the tree with the correct order of the RNs. So it just shows that the iron is important because if you twist and turn a bit, uh, the, the error rate starts to increase drastically. Likewise, we can also use the, the node priority. In, in terms of classification, this will be the Gini index, but this is this regression. Uh, it just tells you like how much it contributes to the purity of the model, but I don't think it kind of makes sense in a classification I and mean, in a regression model because we usually use mean square errors if they're classification yeah for measuring of errors. But they kind of give the same results uh, for the two important one. Yeah but usually uh yeah, you see this one and this one it gives yeah. 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 I try to predict them and this time the error rate seems to be slightly lesser. Well not not a major difference. Uh 3.99 and 3.37. So there was a slight improvement using random forest for the Boston data set in terms of its prediction. And this is the part that we try to use the boosting. The, the book uses this package, but it was unfortunately it was not part of the past knit list, so I can't really use that because the the past list for boosting trees uh, only has these models available. However, I managed to find a GitHub post that tells you how to create this model, custom made model in past But I, I, while it is possible, it's also a bit uh, hard to digest. So I just put the link as a reference and just continue with using what was recommended in the past knit list. We do just they see that they use this package as the default. So I just use that instead. So for boosting, I this is the one with the a lot of tuning whereby I have like three parameters to tune. So the same thing we do a split, we train and we test and create a Cross validation data set. We the recipe is the same whereby uh, we use all the predictors. Uh, this is the one we want to predict, and there's no pre-processing steps. This is the part where we uh, specify our bo boosting tree. We have this past knit boost tree, and we have like three parameters to the tune. So this is the number of additive trees how deep the tree, each tree can go, and the learning rate, which is the shrinking parameter after the first tree has predicted how much will it shrink. 
so that it will give uh, the second tree uh, enough residues to make a better prediction. And the rest is the same. We have the progression and we had a, we used our engine XG boost. And then um, this is how the summary looks like. So we create our workflow as a result. And this is the part whereby we need to reduce a grid with three parameters. So I use uh, this grid Latin hypercube to create this. Uh, so that I can spread the number of trees, the number of deaths and learning rate in a more evenly spread fashion. Uh, there are other ways to spread these parameters as well. A grid Latin cube was one example. Uh, there are two blocks that I can refer to. Uh, one is the tidyverse block to explain the ways you can like split your parameters into when there are more than one dimension. <laughs> uh, we can also have this block as well. That's also in the second link to explain uh, what is the difference between all these grid searches. So I just put the links there. But, but the purpose of this grid Latin hypercube is to ensure that these trees, tree that and the rate are spread evenly across the dimension the, the data space. So with this grid that I have, uh, this is where the, it starts to become quite long to run because the, there are so many parameters. So when I do the tuning, it starts to take a bit long to run. And, and this is the plot that I have for when I use the auto plot, and it, it looks kind of challenging to see what it means. So I guess this is the part where I, I just use the simple matrix, I think. I think for this case, uh, I just use the RMS, I just use RMSE to pick the best learn rate, the best tree depth, and the best tree values. So uh, in this case, uh, it's, I think it's the one with the lowest error rate. So, uh, so I just see the top five and just pick the best one, which was 492 trees. I guess it's this one, uh, five. And this learn rate of uh, 0 0.009, I guess it's either this one, I think. <laughs> so, so with this uh, so-called optimized values to pick the best, I put it back into the workflow. And then I refit the trading model. And this is the part where I can try to use the, to see the model, it's, uh, to see the tree, uh, because the x has some plotting functions. Uh, however, for the, for the sake of this R markdown, what I did was that instead of outputting it straight away by putting render equals to true, I put I export it into a picture and then let the R markdown read the picture. Well, this is because when I ran render equals to true for this right, it, it does give me the plot, but the plot is too big that it fills up the whole markdown HTML file and then the whole screen becomes very small. <laughs> so we have one very big picture of this and then I cannot see all the coding and the content page, they become very small. So in the end, I just export it as a picture and then I put the picture in the R markdown file. <laughs> So this is uh, one plot of the tree. Uh, this is just one of the trees. I'm just plotting just the first tree. But remember, this is boosting is an additive tree. So, uh, and there are a total of uh, 400, and the parameter we have are 492 trees. So we don't need to see all the trees. <laughs> we just see the first tree. Uh, the reason why this uh, five levels because the parameters we choose was five, 
And this is the first tree and how it looks like. Of course, uh, being an additive uh, algorithm, I, we can also see an, a summary of all the trees using this function. Uh, so this is what I did in the code to see the so-called assemble tree. So uh, it's something that I just play around and plot it myself. In terms of what these things means, I, I just try to look at the documentation and yeah, this is what basically what this cover gain and value means like the, the cover is just tells you how much data it covers. 375. So all these will probably add up to 375. And then the value is like the predicted value. Of course, it's it's quite small because it's just the first tree. There'll be there's like 400 over trees to go, and these values will be added accordingly. And then gain is just how much information it gains. Uh, yeah, yeah. How much information it gains. It just tells you like how useful the parameters they expected that for the topmost tree we have the highest gain and as it goes down the tree have the gain starts to get lower and lower uh the sample of all trees looks like this but unfortunately I, I don't really know what these numbers mean because i did not have time to look at the documentation but my guess is to see like i think the least was to tell me like what it value is and then begin an activity tree will just add these values accordingly and and this I think is probably maybe like the threshold of like is greater or less than it will go to this tree but I don't really I'm sorry but I couldn't that is all I, I know about this plot <laughs> and so uh, yes I, I try to put it on the as a variable importance uh, because uh, XGS boost also has an importance plot and in this case they use the gain to classify uh, to, to judge which variable is important it, it, the results are still the same similar to the other models the reason why they have cluster one and two is that if the values are similar to each other like in this case they just blindly cluster them as group one and group two and nothing more than that actually So I, I tried it on the test data set and it seems to perform better than random forest, which was 3.99. But again, uh, maybe not, not so much, not so uh, obvious. Uh. But the last one I tried was the uh the basin additive regression tree. Uh the one that the book used used this R package, but the parsnip list, unfortunately, uh, they only have one function, one option for me to use. So I just use what I have, resources I have. So I did similar, the same thing is that I still have the split, the train and testing and have a cross validation data to do a tuning. And then, but the problem is that I cannot there are some limitations of what I can tune for this uh, function, the, for this debugs package, is that I only can tune the number of trees. I couldn't tune the number of Bayesian iterations or uh, the number of burn-in iterations to cut down on the number of trees here. So I only can uh, control the number of trees for each iteration. So, and another unfortunate thing that I face is that when I use the translate function, it didn't print out the function. It's not just now, unfortunately. But but don't worry, the function still works and the model still works. But it couldn't print out the summary as as it did for the other uh, models. I I guess maybe because it's a new uh thing that the tiny model has added. So I guess it'll take some time for it to improve. But nevertheless, I, I still wish to create a workflow. I, I still wish to create a small grid of trees because this is the only thing I can tune from 1 to 10 trees. 
the, and then this is the part whereby I tune the cross validated data for each tree from one to ten. And this time the R, MSA, and R squares is to tally, whereby they think that having five trees is good enough. So uh, this is just me plotting ggplot2. So again, I used to show best and select best to, to, to pick my best value of trees, which is five. And then I apply it to the workflow. And then I train the data set with the best parameter. And after I train the data set, I can start plotting them by using Extract Fit Engine to get the debug object. And once I have the debug object, I can see the trees individually. So for example, like in this case, I can see the second tree. Remember, I, I choose five trees, right? So there's each iteration, there will be five trees. So I don't want to show the first iteration because the first iteration will just be the mean value and the tree will be very short and not so interesting. Because, because in Bayesian, you must recall that the trees can choose not to change or to change, right? They, have a, they roll a dice to change. So I try to use a later iteration so that I have a higher chance of picking a tree that drastically changed from just being a very short tree to a longer tree. So this is a case whereby I have the second tree for the third iteration. We can see that this is what it looks like. <coughs> and we can see like, like it's very different from the other trees whereby other trees you use this LM stat and the RM as the most important value. But in this case, the the RM was not commonly used. So we can see that each tree is actually very different from each other. And we can also plot the variable importance, but this time you can't use the VIT package anymore. So I use another uh, R package, uh, which is from this uh, GitHub page, which is actually a paper that advertise of how to visualize plots using the debuts package. And Unfortunately, it doesn't work. <laughs> I'm so sad. <laughs> um, yeah, try again with... Uh... <laughs> oh, the paper appears. And they show you how... You're actually advertising the package that, are, that you can actually plot the output of the debugs package to give like these kind of plots. But this is for the classification cases. So for regression cases, unfortunately, are not much plots I can do. Uh. <laughs> so the one I can have is this one, uh, to plot the variable importance. <laughs> and because it's a, a Bayesian tree, you can have confidence interval because each iteration, you have different trees, right? So each tree, it has its own variable importance. So we can have multiple of them. And that's why you can plot the confidence interval, which is different from the others, whereby each tree is only created once. So uh, I, I tried it on the test data, but unfortunately it didn't perform as well as the boosting. Well, not because that this algorithm is not so good, but rather because I kind of cheat the system a bit, it was quite high actually, because if you look into my choosing parameter, my fixed parameters, right, in the, the book, they actually pick a very high value, whereby this was actually like 1,000 and this was actually 5,000. However, when I try such high values, the, the process takes very long. That <laughs> I, I kind of get impatient. <laughs> Of <laughs> uh, course, maybe you can have patience to, be, and I have to make this script anyway. I cannot keep writing me and just keep waiting for like 15 minutes for this algorithm to run. So I just cheat the system a bit. <laughs> but of course, in reality, maybe you want to increase the number of iterations and to a higher number. And maybe the number of trees as well. And the number of, yeah, the number of basic iterations to be a higher number is probably 500. <laughs> yeah, so maybe because my number of 
Bayesian iterations is quite low, so maybe that's why it doesn't perform that well <laughs> as it should. And then I think that's it for today. I, this is how I try to use the tidy models to apply for all the different trees that the book has to offer. Yeah, and I think that's all I, I have. Yeah, in terms of reference or how I get these plots, I just use these blocks and then I just apply them to this data set. It was a different data set, but these plots, like the part trees, the XG bulls, how they, I actually copy from these blocks and then I just tweak them to suit my own data set. So these are the reference that I use. And I think uh, this is not important, just citations of all the packages that I use. So and I think that's it for now. <laughs> Any question? Any questions I, to ask? I don't. You even included the references, but like, how about you? Like, how? About... Oh, we are also running out of time as well. I guess silence means no questions. So. Oh, I was. I, I forgot to say I don't have any questions. I was mute. Ah, uh, okay, no worries. Uh, so but it's time. So I think that's a very clear explanation of like how we can run them. I honestly did not try the lab, so I was just looking at your quotes and try to figure out mentally what was going on. Uh, but definitely I will try this out later. So next week I'll be presenting support vector for about two weeks, then followed by we will follow by other persons. Uh, I have I forgot okay. who's the next presenter. Is it you, Clarus? Mm. I'm sorry, I forgot how to pronounce your name. <laughs> I, yeah, I no. For SVM. Yeah. I guess mine is the, the one after SVM. So I'm doing next week the ad support. Let vector. me check the yeah. sign up sheet. Yeah, I'm the presenter for next two weeks then we should have one more presenter. Yeah, we have the SVM next week, next two weeks for with you. And then uh, I do deep learning on 13th and 20th. Okay, sure. Oh, wait, um, do we want to like 530? It's the Memorial Day in the US um, and people will not be on. What do we want to do? Uh, I, I don't live in the U.S. So <laughs> I think Mille doesn't live in the U.S. as well. And but uh, Rose is in the U.S. and yeah, I'm you. Rose and yeah, I you are in US. U.S. Yeah, you are both in U.S. Right? Like, as the question that is that okay if we postpone one week because then it will affect Jeremy's presentation date as well. But you have something going on, right? In July, you mentioned earlier. Um, um, yeah, I'll check again and see and get back to you. Yeah, just let me know then. We'll see if it, then I'll post in the slacks regarding the if there's any changes to the schedule. Or else, uh, we just proceed then. We will have the record, but then you do have to watch the recording. <laughs> oh. Here's my idea. Um, mm. Why don't we post a question or something in the in the channel and uh -huh. see how many people will attend, how many people won't attend. And then based off of that, um, we can decide whether we want to go into the complication of moving the schedule one week down or not. Yeah. How about that? Uh, yeah, I'll post that question, like a word on Slack and then you guys can vote on that and discuss. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right. See you guys next week. Bye. Yeah, bye. Yeah, bye. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye.